that you would use this very necessary sermon in the day that we live in and uh, please just help us to get this truth and understand it and that we would be benefited from it and that we would be protected by knowing the truth, dear God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Alright, this story that we're looking at in Luke 23 is a story, of course, about Jesus Christ. He's standing before Pilate and Pilate realizes that Jesus is from Galilee. And as soon as he hears that, because Pilate was seeking to put this off onto somebody else, you remember later he's going to wash his hands and say, I have nothing to do with the blood of this just person. And he said three times, I find no fault in him. And so Pilate did not want to condemn Jesus, so he's looking to kind of pass the buck and put the responsibility onto somebody else because he wants to be popular with people. And the people wanted Jesus to be crucified, but on the other hand, he's scared to death because his wife had warned him that she'd had a dream that that uh, Jesus Christ was a righteous person and that he was going to do something terrible to Jesus. And so he's kind of caught in the middle. So he says, oh, you're from Galilee? Well, you need to go see King Herod because that's his jurisdiction. That's his area that he's in charge of. Now, King Herod, this is not the King Herod that was around when Jesus was born. If you remember when Jesus was born, King Herod sent and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof. That's a different Herod. That's his... It's either his father or his grandfather. I'm not really sure. But that's his dad or grandfather. And this is the king of Israel. Although Pontius Pilate is the Roman governor who is actually over the land of Judea and the land of Samaria, this man is technically, he's their king. Kind of like in England today, you have the, the queen and then you also have the prime minister. And the prime minister is the one with the real authority. The queen is more of a figurehead. Same thing here. King Herod was more the figurehead and... The real leader was Pontius Pilate. But King Herod was a little more of an expert in these kind of customs of the Jews because he himself was a Jew, whereas Pontius Pilate was a Roman. And so Jesus is brought to Herod. And this is a strange story because it says that Herod was really glad to see him. Herod was actually very excited about meeting Jesus. He wanted to hear meet Jesus. He'd heard so much about him and he'd heard all the stories and all the fame and the popularity. So he was thrilled to get this chance to meet Jesus. But why in the world, when he asked Jesus all kinds of questions, he talked to him, I mean, very positive attitude, he, he talked to him, he asked him questions, look what the Bible says. In verse number 9, it says, Then he questioned with him in many words, this is Herod speaking to Jesus, but he answered him nothing. Now, wouldn't you think that Jesus Christ, the loving Jesus, the loving God, the Savior of mankind, wouldn't you think that Jesus Christ would answer the question, I mean, give this guy the gospel, right? Get this guy saved, right? Preach to him and, and speak to him, and kind of like he did to Nicodemus, where he explained him how to be saved and preach to him. Wouldn't you think that Jesus would speak to this man who was so interested in Jesus and so interested in the things of God? Well, let's back up a little bit. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 3. And we're going to see why Jesus would not speak to this man. He refused to speak to King Herod. Look at Luke chapter 3 and verse 19 if you would. Same book of the Bible, just back up to Luke chapter 3 verse 19. Luke 3.19, the Bible says, But Herod the Tetrarch, this is the man we're dealing with, being reproved by him, speaking of John the Baptist, he was reproved by John the Baptist, but Herod the Tetrarch being reproved by him for Herodias his brother, Philip's wife, and for the evils which Herod, for all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. Okay, so in this chapter we see that Herod, because John the Baptist had preached against Herod, he had said, it's not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. He had taken his brother's wife away and made him his wife. And so he said, that's wrong. And he preached against him. Then, he preached against him for a bunch of other evil stuff that he did. And according to the Bible, Herod threw him in prison because of this. Now turn to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 7. We'll find out a little bit more about the story. Luke 9, 7. The Bible reads, Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him. He heard of all that was done by Jesus. And he was perplexed because that it was said of some that John was risen from the dead. So there, people were spreading rumor that Jesus Christ was actually John come back from the dead. 
9 it says, And of some that Elias had appeared. That's what some people thought Jesus was Elijah come back from the dead. And of others that one of the old prophets was risen again. And Herod said, John have I beheaded. But who is this of whom I hear such things? And he desired to see him. Now, if you, if, if you read in the book of Mark chapter 6, verses 14 through 28, you'll see a more in-depth account of this story where Herod beheads John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was a preacher who preached against sin. And he didn't care who it was. He didn't care if it was the king. He didn't care if it was the president. He just preached against sin like it a lump it. Well, eventually the king's wife was upset. And so she just kept bugging her husband Herod. You need to do something about this loudmouth preacher. And so they threw him in jail. And of course the story goes on that they, her and her daughter kind of tricked him. And they took him and they beheaded John and brought his head on a plate to dinner on a charger. On a, the charger is basically one of those silver plates that you see where they have the silver dish over it. The fancy presentation bowl. And so it reminds me of these... Uh, the preachers of our day, you know, Billy Graham and, and these guys that will go to these presidential prayer breakfasts where they got the Jewish rabbi, they got the Catholic priest, they got the Baptist. You know, Billy Graham's a Baptist, believe it or not. I don't know if you know that. But you got Billy Graham, you got the rabbi, you got the Catholic priest, and you got the president, you got the Episcopalian, you got some woman preacher over here. And they're all sitting around for the presidential prayer breakfast. And I think of John the Baptist at his presidential prayer breakfast, only he was the entree. He was actually the meal being brought out. His head was being brought out and set on the table. So that's a little bit different than what we see. A little bit of a stark contrast. But John the Baptist was preaching to Herod, and there's another account where it talks about him, you know, Herod speaking with John the Baptist. And the point is, Herod had heard the truth from John the Baptist preached many times. You'll see throughout the story, he'd heard the truth preached. And there came a time where he faced a crisis point where he made a final decision where he said, am I going to listen to what my wife wants? Am I going to listen to what people are pressuring me? Or am I going to listen to the man of God and listen to the truth? And he decided, you know what, I'm going to kill John the Baptist. And he cut his head off. Now, John the Baptist is a picture here of the voice of God. See, remember he said he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness? Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. He's a picture of the Holy Spirit. He's a picture of the one who goes before and prepares the way for a person to be saved, Jesus Christ, that preaches the truth that's the voice of God. Well, Herod had silenced the voice of God in his life once and for all when he killed John the Baptist. And because he had done that fatal error of destroying John the Baptist, there came a time later where he wanted to hear what God had to say. He wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. But you know what? Jesus just wasn't talking to him anymore. Because he'd already made his choice. He'd already gone too far. You see, there's something in the Bible called a reprobate. Now that's a word that a lot of people don't understand and I looked, I've looked it up in the dictionary and it's, it's amazing the, the variety of definitions that you get when you look up a word in the dictionary. So as we go to a few different dictionaries, I found two opposite definitions of this word reprobate in two different dictionaries. And so that's why you can't trust the dictionary at all. It's written by a man, it's fallible, and a lot of people just don't understand what this word means. So what did I do? I, I thought about this word a lot because it's, it's a word that I didn't really understand for a long time. And I looked in dictionaries and I was confused because I used to always read the Bible with a dictionary. But I don't do that anymore because it, it misleads you. But I wanted to know what it means. And so I decided to just look up every time the word reprobate occurs in the Bible. Well, every time the word reprobate occurs, it's not really defined except the first time. The first time it's mentioned, God gives you the definition. Look at Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 30. And we'll see what this word means. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse number 30. And again, I, I, I highly recommend every time you want to know what a word means, look it up the first time it occurs in the Bible. A concept, like a little, a little bit earlier we were talking about speaking in tongues, look up the first time speaking in tongues is mentioned. The first time it's mentioned, Acts chapter 2, you'll find 17 foreign languages listed. I mean, that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with foreign languages. So, when it's brought up again in Acts chapter 10, or when it's brought up again in 1 Corinthians 14, I don't think it changed meaning from the first time God introduced it to us in Acts chapter 2 when He explained to us exactly what it was. It's foreign languages. 
by the time we're in 1 Corinthians 14, it didn't become gibberish. Because it's the same thing. Otherwise, God would have explained to us that it's something new that he's talking about. But God defines things. The Bible's meant to be understood. Look at Jeremiah 6.30. It's a very clear, concise definition of what reprobate means. Verse 30. Reprobate silver shall men call them. The them, we're talking about people. So, a reprobate is a person. Is the first thing I want you to see. Reprobate silver shall men call them. Why? Because the Lord hath rejected them. You see that? A reprobate is someone who God has rejected. God has rejected this person. He wants nothing to do with them. They're, they're a reprobate. They're trash. Literally, the word reprobate means trash. It means, like it's saying here, this silver, it's good for nothing. It needs to be thrown away. It's rejected. That's the illustration of what a reprobate is. It's someone who has been rejected by God. Now look, if you would, at uh, Proverbs chapter 1. And I'm going to show you this concept a little further. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 24. And you know, this isn't really my... And and you'll see when we get into the content of the message. This isn't really my favorite type of sermon to preach. My favorite type of sermon to preach is more like inspirational. You know, exciting type sermon, right? (laughs) I mean, I just want God's best in your life. (laughs) No, I'm not Joel Osteen. But I just like to preach a more inspirational... You know, I want to get up and preach... Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know, I mean, that's exciting. I want to preach those kind of sermons about just living an exciting Christian life and moving forward for God and fighting against the the enemies. But see, here's the thing. This sermon right here is an educational sermon, is what it is. On Sunday nights, a lot of times I'm just teaching the Bible, teaching doctrine. We don't really have we don't have Sunday school. This is Sunday school on Sunday nights, where you learn the doctrine of the Bible. And I'm going to tell you something. If you if you don't learn this, what I'm going to teach you tonight, this could ruin the life of someone that you love. I'm just telling you that right now. This could destroy the life of someone that you love if you don't learn what I'm teaching you tonight. This message may not be the most exciting sermon. It may not be the most uh, dynamic and and motivational and exciting and you just come out on fire for God. But I'm going to tell you something. This could be the most vital sermon that you ever hear. Because this is the most dangerous thing that we're dealing with. And I'm going to explain it to you right now. Look if you would, but let's move into the message. Let's, Let's get a little further in this. Look at verse 24 of Proverbs chapter 1 and we'll see this again. And I, I, I literally... We can just read verses on this all night because this subject is so replete in the Bible, this initial thing that I'm showing you about reprobates. But look at verse number 24. It says, Because I have called, this is God speaking, Because I have called and you have refused, and you refused, I'm sorry, Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. He said, listen, I called you, you refused. I stretched out my hand. He said, I said, hey, put her there, pal. I, I want to be your friend. This is what God's saying. And he says, no man regarded. Nobody wanted to be my friend. Nobody wanted what I had to say. Nobody wanted salvation. I offered it to him. He says, but you've said it not on my counsel. He said, the Bible just means nothing to you. And would none of my reproof. You didn't want me telling you that you were wrong. You didn't want me telling you that you weren't saved. And look what he says. I also will laugh. At your calamity. You say, what? God? A loving God up in heaven is going to laugh at something bad that happens to somebody? Yes. God says, you would none of my counsel. You said it not my counsel. You would none of my reproofs. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. He says, when you're scared to death, when you realize the truth, When your fear cometh, when you realize that you're going to be damned to hell, He says, I'm going to make fun of you. I'm going to mock you. I'm going to laugh at you. Now look, you say, that's not the God that I believe in. If that's not the God that you believe in, then you're an idolater because you've created a false God in your own mind that's not based on the Bible. You've created your own image of God that's Santa Claus. And if you believe in a God that's described by you as something other than what Proverbs chapter 
chapter 1 describes, then you don't believe in the God of the Bible and you're an idolater because you have a fake God. This is the real God. Now look, look what he says here. When your fear cometh as desolation, verse 27, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. You see that? People are going to call on God and He won't answer them. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Notice the hatred. Look, look what he's saying in verse 29 and 30. We're going to see this later in the Bible. He says they hated knowledge. What's knowledge? I mean, that's the Bible. Basically, they hated the Word of God. They hated God's Word. What, what, what's it say in verse number 30? They would none of my counsel. They despised. That's another word for hated. They despised all my reproof. What's reproof? It's something that somebody says to you that you're wrong. Again, it's God's Word. They hated God. They hated His Word. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. And then look at, look at, look at verse number 1 of chapter 2. He's talking to his son. He's preaching this sermon to his son. This is King Solomon preaching to his son Rehoboam, perhaps another son. He says, my son. I mean, he's pleading with him in light of this. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. If thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding. If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasure. Then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And see, here's the positive side of the coin throughout chapter 2. Because he's saying, look, son, there are people who reject God. And God says, you cross the line. Just like, John, just like Herod crossed the line with God. And God said, I'm not, I'm not talking to you anymore. I'm through with you. I'm finished with you. He says, you can cross the line with God. Where God will mock you. When you call on Him and ask Him for help, He'll laugh at you. You call on Him and say, God, I changed my mind. It's too late. You cross the line. You see, there's a person who's called a reprobate who has crossed God's lines too many times. They've heard the preaching too many times. They've heard the plan of salvation too many times. They've heard the gospel too many times. And they said, no, 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 no. And God said, fine. That's what happens. Think about, this wasn't in my notes, but it just came to my mind. Pharaoh. Think about Pharaoh. Moses comes to Pharaoh and says, Thus saith the Lord God of, the, of Israel, let my people go. Hey, who is the Lord? <laughs> who is the Lord? You know, I don't know the Lord. I'm not going to let the people go. And this is what the Bible says. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then a second time, Pharaoh hardened his heart. But you'll notice a transition in that story. Eventually, you know what it starts saying? God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Because it started out, he's hardening his heart. No God, no man of God, no Moses, no word of God. And then what happens pretty soon? God says, you know what? You've said no to me too many times, Pharaoh. And he says, I'm just going to use you as an example to the entire world. You'll read about this in Romans chapter 9. I will use you as an example to the entire world of my power and my wrath because I'm going to destroy your whole nation. And what does he do? He sends these horrible plagues that any sane and normal person would have said uncle, you know, by the time they went through these plagues. But why, did, why was Pharaoh so hard-hearted? Why was he so stubborn that he would just not give in? His, his men came to him and said, Knowest thou not that Egypt is consumed? It's destroyed? Don't you know that our country has been destroyed? He said no. Why? Because his heart was hardened by God. Because God said, If you say no to me enough, then you'll say no forever. And you'll go to hell. And I'll destroy you. Now that, that may not be believed by some people. That might not. They will say, well, you're preaching false doctrine. Well, like, I'm preaching the Bible, okay? I am preaching straight out of the Bible. And if, if I want to, I could show you the examples on and on. There's Herod, there's Proverbs chapter 1, there's Pharaoh, and on and on and on. But look, if you would, let me show you something. Look at, look at Revelation 22, 11. Right at the very end of your Bible. And I'm building the foundation for the message, but look at Revelation 22.11. 
And notice God's attitude in this verse. Revelation 22.11. And this verse, I used, to, I used to really wonder what this verse meant. It says in verse 22.11, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Do you see the attitude there of God saying, You know what? If you, if you want to be righteous... Go ahead and be righteous. You want to be holy? Go ahead and be holy. You want to be filthy? Go ahead and be filthy. You want to be unjust? Go ahead and be unjust. Now, there's kind of a dual nature of God because on one hand, God says He cares so much about every single person in this world. He loves them so much that He died on the cross and went to hell and paid all their sins. That's how much He loves them. He, I mean, he'll send preachers, he'll send prophets, he'll send his own word. He, 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 he butchered his own son on the cross. He died and was buried and rose again. He did everything in his power. He's just calling out. And see, in verse 11, you see just the flippant attitude. Hey, you want to get saved? Fine. You want to live like hell? Go ahead. You don't want to get saved? Fine. You want to be righteous? You want to be holy? Great. Now look at verse number 17. You'll see the other side of God. It says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. See, here he's begging people for the last time in the entire Bible. In Revelation 22, 17, he's begging people to get saved. He's just saying, Come, 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 just get saved, it's free, would you just come? But in verse 11, he's saying, Hey, I don't care whether you come or not. Because this is the way God is, and this is the way we have to be. He'll do everything in his... He cares so much that he'll do everything in his power to save somebody. But then there comes a time where he draws a line and he says, if, it, if they don't get saved, I really don't care. Because there's no skin off my back because I did everything I could. And that's, you know, that's the way that we have to be in some ways. See, I could have this attitude that says, we must get the lost saved at any cost. Any cost. If we have to bring rock music into this church to get people saved, we'll do it. If my wife has to be up here in a mini skirt singing a special, we'll do it. If we have to, if we have to go out and, and go into bars and preach in bars, and if I can sit down with a, with a cold brew next to somebody and give them the gospel, whatever it takes to get them saved. No. We have to have an attitude that says, I'll do whatever it takes within the parameters of God's word, within the parameters of what God says I can do. I'll do anything to get people saved. But see, when somebody rejects the gospel and there's just nothing else we can do, and when we, we have to cross some kind of a line in order to get people saved of God's laws, just say, oh well, fine, go to hell then. And see, see the dual attitude there? Push it as far as you can to get them saved, but if they don't, don't get saved, there's nothing you can really do about it. You just say, fine. You say, if I could tell one lie and get a hundred people saved and they go to heaven, if I could just tell a lie, would I do it? You know, or if I could steal a hundred dollars and, and somebody use that hundred dollars and, and get a hundred people saved. You say, but that's a hundred people that go to heaven. I wouldn't do it. I'd let those hundred people go to hell. You say, well, you're wrong. Well, you know what? That's, God lets people go to hell every day. God sends people to hell every day. He lets them go to hell rather than make an exception of right and wrong. He, he, if he wanted to, he could make it. I mean, really nice people who aren't saved, he could make an exception and let them to heaven. He never does that. Never. Never has done it. He never will. Because God is a God of justice. And he says, I, I'm, I'm too holy to make a mistake. I'm too holy to lie and do wrong. Look, if you would, at Hebrews chapter 6. And we'll see this same concept again. Look at Hebrews chapter 6. Of course, I love the book of Hebrews. We did the Bible study through Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 4. Look at this. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, it's like my salvation, the heavenly gift is the gift of God's eternal life, Enlightened means the light bulb went on their head. They understood the gospel. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance 
seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected. You see that word again? Rejected. And is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. You see that? He says, look, once a person has been enlightened, once a person just, they've heard it and they've heard it, finally it clicks in their mind, they understand it, they've been enlightened, they've tasted the heavenly gift. I mean, they're just that close to being saved, and they, they've been a partaker of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is convicting them, they've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away, to renew them again into repentance is impossible. He says, they're rejected. It's over. When they finally just come so close, and I've seen this. I, you know, I haven't lived that long of a life yet, but in my lifetime, I've seen people who went to church, and went to church, and went to church, and they got so close to getting saved. And then they just said, no. And all their life went downward spiral. And they became evil monsters, literally. Because they just... They, God just rejected them. He said, I pleaded with you, I begged you, and they said no, and God rejected them. And it became too late. Think about, you, you would go on and on, think about Esau. Think about Esau, who God said, he came to the point with Esau, where Esau was a, he was a profane person and a fornicator, the Bible says. And Esau came to the place where God said, I hate you, Esau. I mean, he literally hated Esau. He said, I love Jacob, and I hate Esau. He said, I hate you. And the Bible says that he found no place of repentance. Repentance means where you turn and change your mind. And you know, okay, I changed my mind. I'm going to accept Christ as Savior. He says he, he found no place of repentance. Though he sought it carefully with tears. And so, here Esau lost his chance. Crossed the line with God. Pushed things too far. Yes, God is the God of the second chance. But he's not always the God of the 150th chance. He's not always the God of the 17th chance. And so, that's why the Bible says, Seek the Lord while He may be found. You better, it's, a, it's like if you're not saved, you need to get saved today. Better get saved while you can. Better get saved now before it's too late. Before you push it too far. And God says, My spirit shall not always strive with man. There's people that I reject. Because I get tired of them saying no to me. Think about this. Now, of course, we know salvation is pictured by marriage. In the Bible, in the Bible God explains very clearly that the woman pictures the, the, the human being and, and the man pictures God. And basically, think about this. Can you imagine me coming up to this beautiful young lady on the front row? And I said, will you marry me? Okay, and I proposed to this beautiful girl, right? And she says no. And I, I mean, I've got the $9,000 engagement ring in my hand. And I get on my knees and I say... I love you so much, honey. Will you marry me? Will you be my wife till death us do part? And I, and I hold out the ring and she says no to me. Now, I'm going to be very hurt. I'm going to be very offended. Now, what happens if I do it again? And, and she says no again. How many times do you think this is going to happen? I mean, and then, and then a third time. And she just rejects me and says no, no. You know what? I venture to guess that there's going to come a time where I reject her. There's going to come a time where I get so angry. I mean, I've put so much love into this. I've put so much money into this. And I've put so much thought into this. And I'm, I'm willing to give my whole life to be with you. And you just flippantly just, I don't have time for you. I venture to say that eventually I would begin to hate her. I mean, think about it. This is in real life. I mean, just if this went on month after month, year after year, I'd probably begin to despise her. And there would come a time when I'm not going to ask her and be rebuffed a 25th time. It's not going to happen. Same thing with God. Now look, if you would, at Romans chapter 1. And we're going to see the Bible's clear teaching here in Romans chapter 1. Something that's totally unpopular. Something that nobody hardly believes in. But, what else is new? We're a faithful word Baptist church. <laughs> so, Romans chapter 1. Look at verse number 21. And we're going to watch the Bible explain something to us that nobody believes. But, let's see what God says here.
Look at verse number 21. The Bible says, Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Now these are people who knew God. I mean, they, they weren't saved. Because the Bible very clearly makes a distinction in several places. And I preached on this recently. But the difference between you knowing God and God knowing you are two totally different things. Salvation is when God knows you. Remember he said, depart from me, I never knew you. And on and on. And uh, there's other scriptures about that in Romans, but I, I already preached on that. And so, it says, but when they knew God, I mean, they were exposed to God. They knew all about Him. They knew the gospel. They knew the death, burial, and resurrection. They knew believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. So step one, they knew God. Step two, they glorified Him not as God. Step three, it says, neither were they thankful. Step four, but became vain in their imaginations. Step five, and their foolish heart was darkened. Now look, steps one through four, they're doing it. Okay? Because it says, they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were they thankful, they became vain in their imaginations. See how the subject is they? But then look at the fifth thing there. And their foolish heart was darkened. That's a transitive passive verb, which means that their foolish heart was darkened. That means somebody else is doing the darkening. And they are the darkened E, and somebody else is the darkener. Okay. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. That's step number six. Let me turn my page here. It says, let's see, where am I at now? Okay. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. They brought God down to man's level, is basically what it's saying. And to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Then they brought God down to the level of an animal. Wherefore, God also gave them up. Sounds like God's through with these people. I mean, they, they just, they knew God, they glorified God as God, they, they became vain in their imagination, their foolish heart was darkened. I mean, they knew God. And he, he, they rejected Him. And it says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up. You see that again? Who's doing the giving up here? It's like God says, I give up. God gave them up into vile affections. So the first thing we saw is that God gave them up to uncleanness. Now in verse 26 it says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. Vile. You know what vile means? Vile means disgusting. Disgusting affections. What's affection mean? That's when I kiss and hug my wife. That's affection. So he gave them up into disgusting, vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. You see those key words there, against nature? And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. That's AIDS. That's syphilis. That's the gonorrhea. You see that? And it says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Now look, how can you retain God in your knowledge if you never had God in your knowledge? See that? You retain something means you keep God in your knowledge. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. You see that word reprobate again? God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. What things? Well, what we just talked about, homosexuality, men with men, women with women, doing what things that are against nature, burning it, men with men, burning with lust one toward another, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was me. That's AIDS. That's the disease that God judges them with, and other diseases and other things. So look, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. The homosexual says, God made me this way. He's right. He's right. Don't tell him he's wrong. He's right. 
God didn't make him that way when he was born. God made him that way when he rejected God and he turned him over to a reprobate mind and gave him over to uncleanness and gave him up to lasciviousness and filthy, vile affections. Now look at verse number 29 and we're going to see a roll call of the attributes of the homosexual. You know that homosexual guy at your work? You know that homosexual friend that you have? You know that homosexual relative that you have? Isn't he such a sweetheart? Isn't he such a nice guy? Isn't he just such a sweet, lovable guy? Well, let's see what God says he's like. Because this is who we're dealing with. Let's see what God says he's like. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, and here's the key, haters of God. Remember we saw that in Proverbs 1? Haters of of God. Let me tell you something. Here's a news flash for you. The homosexuals hate God. Did you know that? They hate God. They would none of His reproof. They hated His instruction. And God's going to laugh at them when they're destroyed one day. That's what the Bible says. Let's go on with the, with the uh, roll call, the hall of fame of the homosexual. This is that sweet, lovable guy that serves you on the flight attendant if you fly with AA. <laughs> That's why I fly with America West. <laughs> Sometimes I call it gay A. But anyway, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters. That's gay pride right there. Proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implicable, unmerciful. Implicable means that they're never satisfied. It's never enough. They just always have to take it to the next level. Unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Now what's it say in the Old Testament? If a man also lie with mankind as he lies with womankind, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall be put to death. Boy, but the loving God in the New Testament is much different than that. He just said love one another. No, he said they which do such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. That's when you watch it on TV. That's will and grace, when you have pleasure in them that do them. When you think it's funny to watch it on TV. That's Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. That's every sitcom, that's Friends, that's Seinfeld, that's every sitcom that's on television. I need to learn the new shows. So somebody's going to have to like educate me on the shows that are out right now. Nobody knows in this room. Praise God. <laughs> Glory. <laughs> but anyway, we saw clearly the, the downward spiral. They know God. What's the next step? They glorify Him not as God. They don't want to acknowledge God. They don't want to retain God in their knowledge. So what do they do? They come up with evolution. Where they say, we're going to discount God. And say, boy, I was talking to, uh, I was talking to Chad last night. Uh, Chad is a, is a guy that came out soul winning with me last night. He was in the area. He's, he's working all over Phoenix and Flax, seven different areas. And he came out soul winning with me last night. It was great. He just showed up at the soul winning time. And just it was a very nice surprise. He just showed up and he and I went out soul winning and saw two people saved. But Chad and I were talking about this. and It's fascinating. He is actually an engineer for Daimler Chrysler. And so he pulled up in this Dodge vehicle, I guess made by Chrysler. And he had all these computers and all these things across the dash and laptops set up. And basically, as he drives around in the hot weather, he's testing this automobile and he's getting all the readings while he's driving and that's his job. And he designs, you know, he helps design these automobiles and everything for Chrysler. Well, he and I were talking about this. And uh, I'd never really thought about this. And he was talking about how, you know, he studied physics and this and that. And, and I said to him, I said, you know, it would be really interesting... I just, this thought entered my mind. I said, it'd be really interesting, Chad, if you could take, if you could look at a plant and just see how a plant functions or a tree or an animal and, and just look at how their body functions because they, they all have different cooling systems and fuel systems. And, and what if you could take that and if you could incorporate, because you know it's perfect if God made it. I mean, it must just be the perfect system. And what if you could take that and incorporate that into designing a car? And he said, you know what, that's exactly what they do. He said, sometimes they actually do that. He says that they, Mercedes, for example, took a fish, a certain fish, and they studied the way this fish was shaped because it just maneuvered so well through the water or what, what have you. And they took the way this fish was and they reverse engineered the fish and they kind of designed part of a car based on the way this fish operated. 
And I said to him, I said, wow, I said, that's, that's great that at least they have enough intelligence to know that what God has made is the best thing. I mean, it's, it's got to be the ultimate. So they're, they're actually, you know, taking a second place and saying, God, show us through your creation. He said, no. He said, in the paper that they wrote about this, that he read about this from Mercedes, they said like it was the marvel of evolution. And, and it was just, I mean, I actually thought for a minute that they were acknowledging God. Like, boy, this is what God made. Let's look at it. But actually they said, no, it was, it was this marvel of evolution. So just random chance has produced something greater than the minds of these German engineers at Mercedes, in their mind. Just random evolution. And it's just, it's ridiculous how they just don't acknowledge God. But then the next step is that the Bible talks about how they worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And so what it's saying, they begin to worship the human body. They begin to worship the human... They, and then eventually they'll begin to worship animals. And you'll see, of course, societies that actually worship animals that have degenerated down. But think about the, the worship of the human body. I mean, just look around. Everything is just the body. You go in the mall, it's just bodies. Uh, every advertisement. Turn on the television, you look at a billboard, it's just body. The human body is worshipped. And the downward spiral continues and when a person just rejects God and says no to God, eventually God will give them up. He'll give them over. He'll reject them. And the Bible says that He turns them over to a reprobate mind to do those things that are not convenient. See, no one who is just a sinful man, myself included, has a desire for homosexuality. Period. See, that's why the Bible said it's against nature. That's why I said it's not natural affection. You see, I have a sin nature. I was born a sinner. Adam sinned, and because of that, death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And I have a sin nature. That means that, am I ever tempted to lie? Yeah, of course. Am I ever tempted to have a lustful thought? Yes. Am I ever tempted to uh, uh, hate somebody? Absolutely. You know, am I, uh, hate my brother without a cause? Sure. Am I ever tempted to uh, steal? Absolutely. Am, am I tempted to anything? Yes. Pretty much every sin in the Bible is going to tempt me at some point or another. But am I tempted by homosexuality? No. Because that's not part of my sin nature. That's not natural. See, it's natural for me to be tempted to sin. I mean, that's why my kids, I don't have to teach them to lie. They're going to lie on their own. I have to teach them to tell the truth. Because the nature is going to tell them to do wrong. Sin nature. But look, homosexuality is against nature. Now, let's say I'm driving down the road. I'm, I'm not trying to be crude or anything, but let's say I'm driving down the road and there's a billboard of some kind of a woman that's provocatively dressed. Well, what am I going to do? I'm going to make sure I don't look at that billboard. Right? I'm going to avert my eyes and say I shouldn't look at that. You know, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I'm not going to look at that. I'm not going to lust after that in my heart. And I'm not going to look at it. Now, you can condemn me and say, oh, you're, you, you should just be so above that. You shouldn't even be tempted. And that's ridiculous. I mean, obviously I'm a human being. But if I saw some billboard, and I, and I realize this is ridiculous, and this is a little bit vile, but bear with me. Let's say I'm driving around and there's some billboard of some guy up there, you know, in some pose. Do you think I'm going to be like, oh God, I will say no wicked thing before my eyes. No. There's no temptation. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's stupid. And that any man would agree with that. If you talk to a normal man and said, are you tempted to look at another guy? He'd say, no. That's sick. That's ridiculous. No more than you'd be tempted to look at an animal. No more than you'd be tempted to look at anything weird. I mean, it's, it's, it's not natural. But what turns a person to where they will actually lust after the same gender? I'll tell you what. When God turns them into a filthy animal. When God turns them over to a reprobate mind. When God rejects them and says, look, you don't want to be like Jesus Christ. You don't want to obey the Bible. You don't want to even hear the Bible preached. You don't even want to acknowledge me enough to acknowledge me enough to take you to heaven as, as your Savior. And you want to just throw me aside and go out and fornicate and do wrong. He says, listen to me. Then you can go all the way that direction. And see how good you feel about yourself when I turn you into a filthy animal. See how you feel then. And that's what he does. He turns them... You say, why does God do that? I don't know. But I don't care why. It's what he said he does. He says he gives them over to uncleanness. He gives them up to do those things which are not convenient. 
Look at Ephesians, if you would. Just flip forward about three books in the Bible. Ephesians. And look at chapter number 4, verse number 17. The Bible says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. He's talking about particular Gentiles as other Gentiles walk. Not just the Gentiles in general, but he's talking about a specific group of Gentiles. As other Gentiles walk, certain type of people, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, same exact terminology from Romans chapter 1, where it said their foolish heart was darkened, being alienated from the life of God, through the ignorance that is in them, that's professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, there's your ignorance. They're alienated from God. He's basically rejected them. Because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, you see that phrase, past feeling? Being past feeling, no conscience, no remorse, no guilt, no shame, no desire to do right, their past feeling have given themselves over into lasciviousness, that's the filthy sins that we're talking about, the fornication and so forth, to work all uncleanness, including the sodomy, which is where we saw the homosexuality in Romans chapter 1, to work all uncleanness with greediness. There's your covetousness, that was in the roll call, that was in the list of the wicked sins, characterizing this wicked group of people. You see how consistent the Bible is, and we could go on and on, you know, we could look all over the Bible, God dealing with this sin in the exact same way every time. We could go back to Genesis chapter 18 and 19 where God comes to Abraham and says, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, their cries come up to me. He says, I'm going to go down there and preach to them and see if we can get them saved. Is that what he said? No. He says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my two angels with me and the three of us are going to go down there and see if they have done all together as I've heard. And if they have, I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to kill them. I'm going to just make a clean end of that city. And the Bible says that he rained down fire and brimstone and they said that he poured out uh, eternal fire is what the Bible uses in Jude, Jude chapter 7. That means he literally took fire from hell and dumped it on Sodom and Gomorrah and poured out hell literally on the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and destroyed it. Could the people of in Sodom and Gomorrah have gotten saved? They could have gotten saved in the past but when God came to the point where he was talking to Abraham, it was already too late for him at that point. See, they could have got saved earlier before God gave them up, before they rejected Christ. There was a time when anybody in this whole world could have gotten saved. See, anybody in this world could get saved. But people can cross a line where they can no longer get saved because they pushed it too far. And it's not that if they were to believe on Jesus Christ, he would not save them. It's that they're not going to believe on Jesus Christ because God has darkened their heart. God has hardened their heart and their past feeling. See, that's what the Bible teaches. Look, God so loved the world. Okay, God died for every single person. The Bible says he, he died for the sins of the whole world. He died on the cross for the sin of every sodomite. But you know what? Their past feeling. They've been, they've been given over. It's too late for them. We should have, you say, well, I, I, let's go get them saved. Well, why didn't you get them saved before they turned into a filthy pervert? Because that's when you should have got them saved. Now it's too late for them. Say, I don't believe that. Okay, well then, don't believe that, but show me that. In the, show me in the Bible why you don't believe that. Now, here's the, here's the next thing, and, I, and I'm going to hurry through this. So we've seen, yes, there are people that God rejects. Yes, there are people that cross the line with God. Yes, there are people who are rejected by God. Yes, there are people who God will not even speak to. Yes, there are people who God hates. But, these sodomites, these animals that are called the homosexuals, the gays, the lesbians, the transgender that we're dealing with, that are everywhere we look, that are invading our country, that are every day they're on the news trying to get married somewhere, trying to get acceptance, they're on every television show, they're, uh, they're, they're, it seems like everybody has one in their extended family these days, some distant relative somewhere, hopefully a distant relative. How do they recruit others into their lifestyle? Because can you see that it's spreading? Homosexuality is spreading. I mean, can you see that it's growing? Can you see that they're multiplying? Now, do they multiply the same way that my wife and I multiply? No. I mean, we multiply. We have three kids. We got a fourth one on the way. That's multiplication. But is that how the homosexuals multiply? No. They don't multiply by reproduction. They multiply by recruiting 
That's the only way they can do it. How do they recruit? Well, I will submit to you that there are three examples in the Bible of homosexuality. Now, I'm not talking about verses that are preaching against homosexuality like Romans chapter 1 where God's preaching about it. I'm not talking about Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20 where God is giving laws about it. I'm talking about verses where there's actually a story involved where we get the names of people and we actually get a story that involves homosexuality. There are three in the Bible. All three of the stories, all three of them, involve a homosexual violating another person against their will. All three of them. All three of them. You say, well, what do you take from that, Pastor Anderson? Well, this is what I take from it. Since the Bible has everything I need to know about every subject in the world, no matter what it is, and I mean that, then if I want to know about homosexuality, everything I need to know about homosexuality is going to be in this book. And so I'm going to look at the three times that God tells me a story about homosexuality and and what these people are like. All three of them, three out of three, talk about someone being violated against their will. Because that's what they do. That's what they're about. They are about violating other people and recruiting others into their filthy lifestyle. Let me go through these quickly. Genesis 9. Flip to Genesis 9, please. And uh, look at this. And I'm just going to blow through these quickly. Genesis chapter 9 and verse number 20. And I'm going to tell you something. You say, why are you preaching this message? This is not not helping me. Let me tell you you why I'm preaching this message. Because I know what's going on in this country. And I know what's going on in churches. And I've heard... You know what the young people, people my age and younger, think about homosexuality? They think it's not a big deal. They think it's a sin like lying's a sin, like stealing's a sin. They literally I, I heard I heard a girl say, a teenage girl say, and this is so indicative, and you, you may not believe me, this is indicative of the way that independent fundamental Baptist teenagers and young people feel about homosexuality. Because their parents have put the television in their room with them every night. And this is what this girl said. She said, Homosexuality is like shopping on Sunday. God would prefer that you didn't do it. That was her synopsis. I've heard another teenage boy say that homosexuality is no worse than stealing a pencil because sin is sin. Now look, that's retarded. Because if sin is sin, all sin is sin. All sin's equal in God's eyes. And again, this is a parrot thing. All sin's equal. All sin's the same. You know, people just repeat the same thing often enough and it's true. Uh, I thought Jesus said, "He, uh, listen Pilate, he that delivered me to you hath the greater sin. I thought that Jesus said that the Pharisees were going to get a greater damnation than other people. I thought that God had a whole law book called the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, where he lists different crimes with varying degrees of punishment based on how bad the crime was. Because no, all sin is not equal. If you think, seriously, if you think that stealing a pencil is as bad as homosexuality, then you need to get your head examined. And I mean that. You need to get, you need to straight, I don't even know what to tell you. I mean, if you actually think that, if you actually think that God doesn't see the difference between stealing a pencil and, and fornicating and adultery and homosexuality and, and, and murder and, and, and they say all sins equal. I mean, if you don't think there's a difference between Adolf Hitler okay, and the guy who lives next door to you who uh, doesn't go to church on Sunday, if you, if you don't think that there's a difference between those two people, I, I, I don't even know what to tell you. I don't know where you got that. I don't know where you came up with that. But... For some reason, people believe that everywhere I go. All sin's equal. Homosexuality, lying, it's all sin. Sin is sin. No, sin is not sin. There's big sins and little sins. And you say, oh, look, there are big sins and there are little sins, period. And because God says that some sins, He says it's just a slap on the wrist. Other sins, you pay a small fine. Other sins are the death penalty. Now look, it's true that any sin will send you to hell. Yeah, it's true. Because you can't have any sin to go to heaven. But no, all sin is not equal in God's eyes. Because I don't remember God pouring out fire and brimstone on the city of Tempe. I don't remember God... And, and you, wait, wait a minute. God, I thought all sins equal, God. People in Tempe are sinners. Why don't you pour out hell on earth? Because it's not the same. Because yes, being a sodomite pervert that molests people's children is a lot worse 
than stealing pencils and working on Sunday or whatever. Which is a stupid statement because it's not even wrong to work on Sunday. I mean, it's wrong to miss church. But Sunday's not the Sabbath day. Saturday's the Sabbath day. That's Old Testament. That's a whole other sermon. Anyway, look at, look at, look at Genesis chapter 9. And I, this sermon must be preached because somebody has to stand up and tell the truth about this. And it happens to be me. Genesis 9, 20. The Bible says, And Noah began to be an husbandman. This is Noah after he got off the ark. And he planted a vineyard and he drank of the wine and was drunken. And he was uncovered within his tent. By the way, it's the first time alcohol is mentioned in the Bible. Great light that it sheds on. And he drank of the wine and was drunken and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. You see that word done? He knew what his younger son had done unto him. You see, Ham, Noah's son, was a sodomite. He was a filthy pervert. He got off the ark and he molested his dad when his dad got drunk. That's what happened here. And so here we have the first instance of homosexuality. Somebody is molesting somebody else when they're not knowing what's going on when they're drunk. And he molests them. He sees what his son had done unto him. And he curses him. And he says, you know, he says all manner of bad things about him. But anyway, he curses him. Second example, Genesis 19. Look at verse number 4 and 5. Flip forward to Genesis 19. Genesis 19, 4 and 5. The Bible reads, But before they lay down, these are the two angels that God sent to Sodom. They look just like ordinary men. But before they lay down, the men of, so of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, so these are kids, these are adults, they're sodomites. All the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. So here they want to take these two men and force them into homosexuality against their will. Second instance. So far we've seen two times, and both times somebody's being violated against their will. Now flip to the last one. and this is probably, this, Yeah, this is the last scripture I'll have you turn to. But look at... Judges 19.22. And you see the third instance in the Bible. And this is, this is exhaustive. I mean, these are the only three times it's mentioned in the Bible as far as in a story format where we see these characters playing out in a story. Look at Judges chapter... Let's see here. Judges chapter 19, verse 22. Let me turn there myself here. Judges 19.22 in the Bible reads... Now, as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house that we may know him. So again, they want to violate somebody. They want to rape somebody. They want to force somebody into homosexuality. Look, I submit to you, and you may not like this, but... Every homosexual is a child molester. Every homosexual is a rapist. Every homosexual is a recruiter. Because every homosexual in the Bible is a recruiter. So I just tend to think that this is a microcosm of the world that we live in. If three out of three in the Bible are molesters and recruiters and rapists, then three out of three out there. You say, are you homophobic? Yes. I don't want to be in a dark alley with a bunch of these homosexuals besetting my house roundabout saying, bring Pastor Anderson out that we may know him. I don't want them surrounding my house because, yes, I am, I'm scared to death of them. Yes, I am homophobic. I don't mind that term. I am scared to death of them because they want to violate me. They want to violate my children. They want to hurt me. They want to hurt somebody and try to recruit them into being a filthy animal like they are. Now, I, I'm trying to condense this and the sermon's almost over. I'm sorry that it's a little bit longer than usual, but I'm trying to condense this down and make it short, but Here's the thing. I can show you on and on. There's so many scriptures. The Bible talks about people, you know, beguiling unstable souls. It talks about people going after young people, children. This is the homosexual's method. The homosexual, and you, could, you, you know that you've heard of this happening. You know it's, it's happened probably to people that you know personally. You know that you hear about it happening. What do they do? They, they find somebody who's young. They find a child. They find a teenager. And what do they do? 
They molest them. They recruit them. What is the reaction of that young person? How could God let this happen to me? And I've heard him, I've talked to him. How did God allow this to happen to me? I can't believe that a loving God would allow me to be violated and, and perverted like this by, by my uncle or by my aunt or by my cousin or by my friend at school. And what happens is they can't deal with it because they're so young. They can't deal with the fact that they've been raped and abused and violated by this sodomite. And so what do they do? They start to wonder, maybe I'm a sodomite. You know, because they've been so brainwashed that so you might be born that way. And so what do they do? They start to get angry at themselves. They start to feel guilty like it was somehow their fault. Even though it wasn't. And they start to turn their anger toward God. And they start to be bitter against God. They start to hate God. And what happens is a lot of times the people who are the very victims of the sodomites are the ones who end up being converted to sodomy. Because they, you know, they weren't saved. They, were, they didn't really know. They were too young. or they, they just didn't really understand. Or they just weren't saved for whatever reason. And sometimes they can become a reprobate and just turn to hatred for God, turn against God. Other people are sometimes effeminate. And uh, they'll get, that's who's targeted sometimes by these crowds too. I've seen it in school. I've seen effeminate kids be attacked by the sodomites in, in Christian school and public school. And then they'll go after them. They'll go after the weak little sissy who, whose dad's not there. And they'll go after him and they'll, they'll give him acceptance. They'll get him into their group. They'll violate him and they'll turn him against God like they're against God. And they'll turn him into a filthy reprobate animal like they are. But one last point that I want to make about this. Do the sodomites only prey on the same gender? Do they all, I mean, is, let's say... Uh, you know, uncle so-and-so is a sodomite. Let's say cousin so-and-so is a sodomite. Is he only going to prey on males? Or is he going to prey on females? Well, let's look at our three examples. Well, I'll just go through them quickly. Look at Ham. Okay, Ham was a sodomite. Ham molested his dad. He's a filthy pervert. He's also married with children. Did you notice that in the story? Did you know he's married and lists his children? Second story. Sodom and Gomorrah. Every man in the city was involved in this filthy event that's going on. Now let me tell you, ask you something. If there's a city where you have men and children, and the Bible says that there were children in the city, and the Bible says that there were women in the city. So if there's men, women, and children in the city, and every man in that city is a sodomite, it sounds like these guys are going both ways to me. Because if every single one of them's there, who's producing these children? Who's married to these women? Third example. And uh, you have to read the story in your own time. And it's, it's kind of a vile story. I don't even want to really explain it in church in front of children and everything. But basically, the, these men, when they don't get the man that they're looking for in Judges chapter 19, what happens? The man of the house ends up sending a woman out and throwing a woman out to this angry mom of homosexuals. And what do they do? They, they rape the woman to death. And you know the story from reading it. They take, they take a woman and throw her out there to satisfy this mob and they were, hey, they went for it. Because see, every, you know, not to use the world's terminology, but every sodomite it goes both ways in the Bible. All three, all three occurrences. And they'll go after anybody. Don't let them lie to you. Don't let the world tell you the definitions of these things. Let God tell you the truth. Let God tell you what they're about. Let me tell you something. Don't let your kids around anybody that you don't know. Ever. Don't let your loved ones... Don't let your niece or nephew, don't let your grandkids, you watch them like a hawk. Because I could tell you the stories. I mean, I, it's so depressing to me to think about people that I know and that I love. I mean, my blood's boiling right now. And just to think about how young lives have been destroyed. People's lives have been ruined forever. Because some parents said, oh, they go to church. They must be right. Let's drop our kids off with them. And, and the, the end was disaster. You know, they dropped him off. They sent him on some trip with, with some other couple. Oh, but he's a married man. He's married. No, he can't be a pervert. He's married. Oh. Both real life and in the Bible, the stories go on and on about the married man who's a pervert and a pedophile and a sodomite. On and on. Don't ever leave children with people. And, and especially if you know, if you have a relative that's a homosexual, stay as far away from him as you can. And get kids as far away from them as you can. I don't care if it's your I don't care if it's your brother. 
I don't care if it's your sister. I don't care if it's your mom. I don't care if it's your, your, your anybody. I don't care if it's your Siamese twin. Okay? Just get as far away from them as you can. Because they're, they're, they're after one thing. They're already on their way to hell. God's already damned them to hell. All they want to do is just turn as many people to their filthy lifestyle as they can. You say, Pastor Anderson, do you love the queers? Do you love gay people? No, I don't. I hate them. You say, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, you're supposed to love everybody. Well, I'm sorry, my friend, but I'm not really that into tradition. You might have figured that out by now. And I don't really let some Baptist preacher tell me what I believe. I let this book tell me what I believe. And this book says right here, Do not I hate them, O Lord? This is Psalm 139. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. This is Psalm 139, 21 and 22. I count them my enemies. You see, is the homosexual my friend? No, he's my enemy. Do you love him? No, I hate him. How do you hate him, Pastor Anderson? I hate him with a perfect hatred and I count him my enemy. And then listen to the next words out of King David's mouth. These verses are often quoted, but let's put them in context now. Here's the popular famous verse. Let's put it in context with, I hate them with perfect hatred. I count on mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. He says, listen, God, I hate them. I hate those that hate you. I hate these filthy, reprobate haters of God. I hate them. And I hate them with a perfect hatred. He says, Hey God, search me. No my th- Is there anything wrong with that? <laughs> is there anything wrong with that? And of course the answer is no. There's nothing wrong with that, David. Because re- even, even last Sunday morning, remember the sermon we preached on Jehoshaphat? Second Chronicles 19.2 Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Should you love those that hate the Lord? Should you love the Sodomite? I, be- I, will, I will put this out to you then you can call me a fanatic and a weirdo. I will say to you that it is a sin to love homosexuals. Because in 2 Chronicles 19.2, it says it's a sin. 2 Chronicles 19.2 says that it is a sin to love the pervert, hater of God, sodomite, filthy animal. It says it's a sin. Don't love people that hate God. And so, do I want am I going to go out um, on a soul winning campaign to see the queers saved? No, I'm not. Because it's too late. I mean, I, you know what? I, I, I'm not happy that people go to hell. I'm not happy that anybody goes to hell. God doesn't have pleasure in the death of the wicked. But you know what? I just, when I, I really just, the people that I know that are sodomites, and especially the ones that I know that have molested children and have ruined people's lives, and I could give you the names of the lives they've ruined. What do, I, what do I want for those people? I want nothing more for them to die and go to hell. That's what I want for them. Before they can destroy any more people along the way. You say that's not love. It is love because I love the people that they're trying to destroy. I love the people that they're trying to abuse. That's who I love. And you know what? Yes, God loved them. And God did everything He could for them. He put out His hand as it said in Proverbs 1 and He said, please, would you come? Would you come all the way from the book of Genesis all the way to Revelation 22, 17? Would you please come and take the water of life freely? I died on the cross for you. I love you. Please, come. And they said, No! And God said, that's it. I've had enough. It's over. I'm through with you. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. God, I just... God, I've delivered my heart this this evening, dear God. We've seen what what you've said in the Bible. What What a scary world we're living in right now, God. What a scary place the United States of America is in 2006. What a scary thing to think that our families... And our country and our neighborhoods are inundated and infested with these recruiters, these rapists, these pedophiles, these people that are known as the gays. But we know what they are, God, because you told us what they are. And you know what? I don't care. I don't care if it hair lips every stinking preacher that, that, that walks the face of this earth. And I don't care if it hair lips the whole world, God. I am against the sodomites. I hate them. You hate them. And God, if you and I are the only ones that agree on that, then so be it. Because pretty soon you and I are going to be sitting side by side anyway. And so God, I just pray that you would please just speak to every heart that's here and and 
God, would you please just impress upon those that are here the, the danger that they would be sober and be vigilant and guard their children and guard those that they love from this menace known as the homosexuals, dear God. Please just protect us. Keep us safe. Keep my children safe, dear God. And we love you in Jesus' name.